Hi, I'm Michael Archer, uh, professor of biological science at the University of New South Wales. And Michael, are we alone in the universe? Of course we're not alone, Charlie. The universe is filled with life. The question is, are we alone in terms of being sentient life in the universe? And, and about that, I'm not so sure. How do, what makes you think the universe is filled with life? Because every now and then it sends us a Christmas package. Oh. All these meteorites come in and they are loaded with every conceivable amino acid and building block of life. Every time you send in a meteor to Earth and you smack Earth, it, it demonstrates how easy it is to produce nucleotides. So all of the basic building blocks of life are already out there in grand abundance. Um, and what we know about organic molecules, which is kind of fascinating to me, is a bit like snowflake. The, the transcendent emergent property of water is that it can produce a beautifully complex thing like a snowflake. And I think that's the transcendent, irresistible, unavoidable outcome. Once you have a lot of organic molecules, you are going to get life. It's inevitable. They Self-aggregation is what organic molecules do. Well, uh, I think physicists will not give you an argument about the snowflake because water is everywhere in the universe and uh, if sometimes it freezes and it makes snowflakes. Uh, however, you seem to be confounding or involving ingredients with recipe. Maybe the, no one would argue that the ingredients, I mean, everybody knows the ingredients of life are everywhere, but they're usually monomers. They're not usually the polymers. So, and people for the past 10 years, 20 years, 30 years have been trying to make life in the laboratory, but it, they haven't you know, created a little Frankenstein organism there. Uh, they're close, they're very close. I mean, you know, we've only had 50 years playing around the laboratory and the tools are getting better and better all the time. I mean, when the first experiments were, experiments were done, it was, it was demonstrated that with nothing except all the inorganic components and a little spark, um, you can get all the amino acids you want to build life. So, and then you can start to play with those and you can get nucleotides. It, it's, I think, if in the small amount of time in a tiny little laboratory, this kind of progress has been made, and then you, you multiply that times the size of the earth and all of the water bodies that were there in which these kind of natural experiments could be played over a billion years, I, I find it impossible to conceive that it isn't a certainty that there is life all over the universe. I'm sure it is. Whether we want to talk to it or not, okay, let, let alone let's, meet let's it, is another the, matter, I guess. Let's just stick with the, the life question. So try to convince somebody, try to convince me that of this statement that you just made, that you're convinced that there's life all over the universe and you invoked ingredients, and that's fine. But what about the recipe, putting it together? What about the information content? Well, we, we have this kind of retrospective presumption that somehow to qualify as life, we have to deconstruct what we know to be life here, and then we start to talk about the improbabilities of compositing those little building blocks of life to achieve the end product that we've got now. But of course, there are 100 billion potential alternative outcomes of playing with organic molecules. Um, I, I think it's, it's our, our presumption that somehow we are the epitome of what life should become, um, and that all these other potential outcomes are, are you know, not things we're really thinking about. It could have happened in many different ways. Well, what do you mean by life? Good question. Let's define I'm not, you, you can't convince me that viruses are not alive. I know there's a big argument about this, but uh -huh. as far as I'm concerned, um, they are capable of reproduction. We already know some of the viruses actually have the machinery um, that looks like they may have been descended from self-reproducing, self-supporting organisms and that they kind of degenerated into the viral mode. So I, I think, as far as I'm concerned, life, in fact, uh, let me think about that, Charlie. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of this guy who, George Pointer, George Pointer. George Pointer is the fascinating paleontologist who's been trying to extract DNA out of the bums of insects um, that have been trapped in amber and they're 30 million years old and he says he's done this and that he's getting DNA out of this stuff. And his, he, he was asked the same question. Um, are, is this alive? Yes, you know, you've got the DNA out of these 30 million year old um, insects. Um, does this mean that you have got 30 million year old life? His view was, and, and I, I share it, that any um, 
any substance, basically, that can be put into the right context and that can um, then produce products of the kind that we regard to be the stuff of living tissues is alive. A fragment of DNA, if put into a genome and it works and produces a product, it produces proteins, um, is alive. A, a kidney stripped out of a guy who's dead on the road for five days and the kidney works. It actually works in somebody else. The guy's technically dead, legally, but his kidney was fine and, and it's, it's going to help somebody else stay alive. Do you, think when, do you think there's life on Mars? Now? I don't know. Uh, do I think there was life on Mars? I would say it's highly probable. I'm, I'm one of the believers, I'm afraid. So do you think that of all, let's say there are lots and lots of rocky planets all over the universe, do you think that the rocky planets that have water on their surfaces, do you think uh, that they all will have life? I'll bet, I'll bet more than half of them do. More anyway. than half of them. So I guess the real question is, why wouldn't there be life? Are you, and of course, it, again, it comes back to your question about, well, what is life? You know, and this is a pretty broad parameter. I don't think a quartz crystal self-replicating itself is alive in the sense that we want to think about life. But I think there's a lot of alternatives between that, a lot of different kinds of things, and, and the kind of life that we accept as surrounding Earth now. Well, you're using the word life as if you know what it means, and you're a biologist, so you should know what it means, but I've never met a biologist who, who had a good definition of life. And, uh, and when I talk to people who are these, trying to synthesize life in a laboratory, they keep on asking, like Steve Benner, for example, mm. or they say, how much information do I need to make it alive? Mm. And it makes me think of Spiegelman's monsters. Mm. Now, Spiegelman's monsters was you turn life form into a couch potato by giving it everything it would need, so it doesn't need legs, doesn't need enzymes, doesn't, and even if you, you can outsource its reproduction, so it wouldn't need that, so you can essentially take life and just remove all of the information, and then there's no barrier between life and non-life. Mm. So you're using the word life as if there is a barrier, so can you justify that? Uh, I hadn't actually thought about it myself in that sense, to try to define it in a way that would satisfy me and everybody else. I guess life, as far as I'm concerned, is defined by the way that I see life on planet Earth. Yes. From uh, but that makes the whole thing, but but that makes the whole thing of projecting life elsewhere problematic because you're defining it based on what I am. you have around you. I, am. I confess that the kind of life I'm thinking about is like carbon-based life forms uh, from Archeans on up, but I acknowledge that I could think there could be other ways that there are life forms. Um, the silicon-based life forms are one of the ones that people have talked about a lot and speculated about. Um, quartz crystal is silicon-based in that sense. Um, but on the other hand, we don't think about those things. We, don't, we somehow think that there are going to be obstacles on the way to becoming sentient life forms of the kind that we would want to have a conversation with. I can't imagine a quartz crystal ever getting to be philosophical about the reason why it exists in the universe. Um, and I'm looking for that. When I'm, when I'm talking about life, I'm talking about the, the continuum between our key and simplest of, of um, bacterial type life forms all the way up to whatever. Up, you used the word up. I did, it's a terrible word. Yeah, out. why did you let use me, it? Let me, sit, let me use the word out. <laughs> out in all directions, <laughs> Charlie. All right, now, it is true, I've done a survey, and it's true that most people don't care about microbes, they care about sentient aliens. They're looking mm. for somebody to talk to, to solve their yes. problems. Scientists are looking for God to solve all their problems, and other people no, no, are just no, looking, looking for No, 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 we're looking for sentient forms to tell us whether there is a God or not. That's so a lot of people are looking for uh, some advanced civilization so advanced that they know the answers to all the questions. So it's kind of like looking for God. It is. Yeah. And, uh, and, or looking for other human beings who are nice, or are not mm. going to kill us. Yeah. So that's what we, most people are looking for. So then comes the question, as a scientist, you're a biologist, you've studied fossils and mammals. Now, let's, if we did this thought experiment and replay the tape of life, starting at the Cambrian or starting 200 million years ago mm. or starting 100 million years ago, um, do you think that anything like human-like intelligence would evolve again? No. You don't? No. Not, not on Earth. Not, not the one-shot kind of um, arrangement. You got, you're just taking your, all the players off the table, but you got the same dice to start with, the yes. organic dice. 
and you chuck them out. You're going to end up with the same outcome. Not the same. That, so, so, so some people think that there is a human-like intelligence niche, no. that, and when there's a niche, that's a generic word towards which a species, you know, niche. Some people think that life just is uh, flourishing and abundant, and it will evolve to vary into all the available niches. So the question mm. is, is human-like intelligence such a niche? I don't think there's a chance of that, frankly. Okay, I, th I think we're talking about a, a miraculous improbability to achieve the kind of sentience that we've got because it doesn't have function or it's just marginally functional. And in fact, you'd have to ask the question, if we've only been on this planet as a sentient species for about 300,000 years, this is a very early stage in a very bizarre biological experiment and there's no guarantee it's going to have any utility or any, fu no. or any future value. Beanie, Beanie, cut it out. Now, see, that's, that's why. I mean, here is an advanced mammal, this dog, that, advanced, that's been, advanced yeah, compared to what? It, there's 40 to million possum? years of mammalian evolution going into building brains <laughs> that can outwit the, the herbivorous species that, that it wants to eat. And you can't have a conversation with a dog. I mean, and you'll never be able to have a conversation with a dog. You just talk to it several times. But I can ask it, is there a God? I mean, you know. Well, is that having a it conversation? It knows there's a God. It's me. <laughs> okay. All right. I can turn on light switches and make miracles. So. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> but I've, I've noticed that there's a slight dichotomy between mm. biologists and physicists about this. Com For example, Paul Davies and many physicists mm. and Carl Sagan thinks that there is a human-like intelligence niche and it is so wonderful and adaptive mm. that we should expect it elsewhere. Most biologists, but not all, think that you shake your head and say no. Yeah. So can you straighten out the, the physicists who are listening well, about you know, this issue? I think, Charlie, you once explained to me something actually that, that made me stop and think. And I think it's a very good point. And you look, at, look at Earth, for goodness sake. I mean, we've got three and a half, probably 3.8 billion years of evolution of life on planet Earth. And in the last, just the last 300,000 years, suddenly we have a sentient creature that's able to examine itself and think about why does it exist. Um, and that happened on only one continent. I mean, the same, the same wherewithal to produce a sentient creature was on every other continent on Earth, but it didn't happen there. So why wasn't the niche automatically filled over the same space of time, starting with the same building blocks in other parts of Earth? It didn't. No, you're preaching to the choir here, but the arguments I've gotten pushing back on that argument is, we're just the first. Well, it's taken a long time to get to be the first. <laughs> now, the, so that's an important, I mean, that's an issue. We're just the first. But when I hear that, I say, wait a minute, you're assuming that there is, and then you're saying we're the first. Uh, it's like saying the, the sulfur crystal cockatoo, why aren't there others? Well, it's somebody has to be first. And I said, no, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a first uh, sulfur crystal yeah. cockatoo. That was my, do you agree with that or? I just don't see the idea that there is a niche. It doesn't make any sense to me that there is a niche for this because to get, I think it's just a, a, a curious accident that we have had a super, um, um, a super abundance of, of um, neural tissue in our head. And I think it has to do with neoteny. I think there's a number of biological processes that can trigger um, a change in a lineage for some particular reason. But I think that the large brain we've got is a complete accident of selection that was working for something else, i.e. a shortening of the face. Um, there's a whole range of reasons why you would neotenize something um, to make them sexually mature as juveniles. But I think what's happened to us is that we have had a, a, a slowdown in our bodily clock so that we become sexually mature as babies and we stay as babies longer. We grow at gr baby growth rates for a longer period of time and therefore our brain growing at the juvenile growth rate has had longer time to get bigger. I don't think that was an adaptive consequence. I don't think we, we got a bigger brain gradually because it was more adaptive each time. I think it was just an accident from, from day one. They ended Something up with selected. this big nut. What, why would you be selected for neoteny? Why would we have been? There are a million reasons why you would be selected for neoteny. I think in, in the human case, I think one of the principal reasons is in having the, the brain growing at this colossal rate for a long period of time, longer than occurs in chimps, we become preeminently learning creatures. We can assimilate a huge amount of information so that we're not dependent anymore on instinct. We're now probably principally dependent on communicated ideas between but that, individuals. But that's an argument for selection for brain power. I thought you were going to make an argument for neoteny in itself independent of brain power. 
But I think neoteny is the tool that, that the reason this has happened is neoteny has kept us growing at a juvenile growth rate for a long time. What about, I've heard that our brain case, our brain increased in size by a factor of three mm. uh, between about three or two million years ago. Mm. What was happening three and two million years ago? Did we invent fire and therefore we could cook food? Or what was, yeah. what was happening between three and two that allowed this, was it sexual selection that women said, hey, I want guys with big brains and that was selected for like a peacock's tail? Mm. Or what, what, can you throw a few ideas, speculative ideas at this? I, I think it is when the aliens came in actually and found the brightest creature on planet Earth and ramped up our brain power. And oh, so, so we're domesticated I apes. think that's what the happened. Aliens domesticated thought, and then they left. Let's pick one and, and we'll <laughs> okay. come back I'll, in a few okay. thousand That sounds years ridiculous. Let's try another. Um, I, I suspect that the, well, the, the, the common um, explanation that you often hear is fire, yes, and it says, well, we're cooking meat, and we're eating lots of protein, and this is accelerating the ability to build a bigger brain. That doesn't cut it with me, really. Um, I, think, I think it's helped facilitate it, but I think, I come back to the, the argument about neoteny. I think the reason it happened is that we had this accelerated deceleration of maturation of our body. We live longer than we should for our size and so on. All of these are neotenic features, but why did neoteny trigger in at that point? Mm, yes. And I don't have an answer for that, Charlie. I, I, I can't think of a single non-human uh, sort of environmental factor that occurred about that time that would explain it. Wasn't that the right answer? There is no answer? Because, Probably. I mean, if you're gonna say that you doubt that there, that human-like intelligence evolved mm -hmm. elsewhere, then, and we know that there are Earth-like planets with water and maybe mm -hmm. life, then we need, we have to not have an explanation for our brains because we're not, we're, they're not gonna be elsewhere. Correct. So is that, you're I happy with that? I buy that argument. I you buy that. Yeah, I think it is, it, it, it's so smug of us to sit here as sentient creatures and, and, and sort of make the presumption that this has happened everywhere else and we start to calculate the, the probability that this has happened how many times. It could have been just a one-off event and yet it left us here presuming that there must be other events like this occurred in the rest of the universe. Well, isn't and yet it may never have happened other than this one time here on Earth. When you say it, but aren't, isn't every species a one-off event? These yes, flowers of there? I mean, so Absolutely. So when people come, but we're to not me, looking for any species. We're looking for a sentient species. We can have a sensible conversation. So we're looking with. for ourselves, more or less. Well, I would, no, we want somebody smarter than us. <laughs> I, I don't think we want another clever dog. I don't think. So. I, think uh, I think we want a really smart alien that's benign and will mm. not use its power yeah. against us. We want an ET. You know, an ET. And yeah. okay, so you think, however, that it's very unlikely that. Of benign aliens that have, with human-like intelligence are out there? Well, I definitely think that the probability there's benign aliens out there is close to zero. I mean, I have seen every science fiction movie that there is. I know what's waiting out for there. And I think <laughs> Stephen Hawking was right. We really have to think hard about whether we want to try to communicate with what's out there. Mm. We've already sent them out a menu, you know, in, in Voyager mm. that shows them a star map where the restaurant is and what we look like when you come here to dine. Mm. Um, do we really want to do this? I mean, we think about humans, the most unpleasant species, the most intolerant, environmental destructive species that has ever evolved on Earth. Why would we think that intelligence, if it evolved in the same way anywhere else, wouldn't lead to the same self-serving, um, unpleasant, vicious little carnivore somewhere else. Are these really the kinds of aliens that we want to have dinner with, uh, you know, or dine with? Maybe that's a better way to now, put it. Now, I think Lynn Margulis uh, said that if, you know, the Earth has a virus and we're the virus and it's trying to shake us off and when we go extinct, it would be better for the Earth. So you subscribe to that? Yeah, I do, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's but very that, misanthropic. That, that's terrible, I know, I know. <laughs> and I feel really guilty about that, but I do feel that. It's because in all of my life, as a biologist, as a paleontologist, I've fallen in love with the diversity of life on planet Earth. And you can't help but feeling a sense of responsibility for making sure that as much of this as possible goes on to continue to do wonderful things. But without humans? Um, and this is the hard part. You know, all of a sudden I want a little caveat on my let's get rid of the viral human thing. Mm -hmm. My caveat is, as long as I can come back every thousand years and just see how it's going, you know, 
somehow. <laughs> I want, I, want to be, I want to be aware of what life does, and that's what humans do. But I want to be aware of, of life doing its wonderful thing on planet Earth without simultaneously destroying it, and that's our dilemma. Well, why aren't you then promoting, hey, we need uh, 100 million people on Earth and no more, and so that would have been a... I am. I, e I even joined the, you know, the let's constrain our population political party or whatever until they told me they only want to double our population. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> No, okay. we want to get, I mean, Australia, we're talking about Australia here. Australia never had a population prior to European invasion of Australia larger than about a million people. That was a measure of what Australia can sustainably, oops, sorry. That, that was a measure, I'll pick my dog up so you okay. get continuity of that little event. Right. Here, noodles, okay. come here. Are you ready? Okay. Because my dog okay, wants to have a conversation. Okay. Come here, noodles. Um, that was a measure of the fact, the fact that we only had a million people in Australia, that's what Australia could support in terms of a human population. And here we are with a staggering, you know, 20 or 30 times that number and, and with economists arguing we should double that, pure insanity. We're chewing up Australia in a way that's totally unsustainable. So yeah, we are, we're definitely a, a problem. Okay, let me ask you another, switch gears a little bit. The question, are we alone, is that an important question? To me it is. Uh, it's an important one because intellectually I can't help asking the question. And I guess, you know what I'm looking for, Charlie? I'm, I'm looking for that smart alien who will turn around to my dumb colleagues and say, you've just wasted your whole life worshipping a, a fictitious, invisible guy who you think is sitting in the clouds. I, I want humanity to recognize that it, it should be committing its creative strengths and genius to solving real problems instead of playing stupid things with religion. Religion is a disease, much worse than the humans. It corrupts our brain. It corrodes our ability to do wonderful things with this accidentally huge nut that we've got. Now, you might have read Sapiens by Harari? No. Oh, I can recommend that. Anyway, um, there's a movie. You said you've seen a lot of movies. Uh, Contact. You've yeah, probably seen love Contact. It. In that movie, Carl several... Sagan. I mean, and wasn't it wonderful that here, the heroine, Jodie Foster, was actually an atheist? Now, I, mean, I thought that was a mark of when America was starting to grow up. <laughs> they could allow that a really bright, admirable person might not actually believe in God. <laughs> I see. Um, Anyway, in that movie, several times... You're never going to be able to use this overseas. <laughs> <laughs> several times in the movie, mm. Jodie Foster's character mm. is asked, are we alone? At the end, especially, mm. but also when she's in bed with the guy at Arecibo. But at the end, the little child, 10 years old, says, are we alone? And she said, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. <laughs> Now, that answer was given several times by Jodie Foster's mm. father, by her lover, you know, mm. the yeah, yeah, theologian yeah. guy, and then here's the answer that she gave to this kid. Yeah. So what do you think of that answer? I'm not awfully impressed with that answer. I think that in, when they made that movie, they had to make a few little compromises in a sense for the, um, I guess, the more um, naive ideas about space and life and so on. Uh, waste of space, it, that's a human concept, isn't it? I mean, space is, there's not enough zeros that you could put in front of a number uh, with a decimal point in front of that to say how little there is out there. It, space is a colossal it, waste of space, if you like. But it reminded, uh, it's a was, it may be, Charlie, it's a waste of an opportunity, in a sense, if you, want, if you think that having an intelligent species in the universe is a, is a useful opportunity, and I'm not sure for what. Well, I was a little bit more harsh on that. It reminded me of the uh, British attitude of terra nullis about mm. Australia, mm. that, hey, there are no European civilizations here, therefore no one's here. Mm. So if there's no sentient life out there, then uh, it's a waste of space. Mm. So that's, I'm a little bit, you would, you're not that harsh, though. So. Oh, I'm sorry, I know what's going on now. It's, they're using a nail gun that sends noodle off out of her tree. <coughs> okay. Noodle, you just gotta set, all right, but she's just gonna shiver and shake, which is gonna look all really right. weird. You can hold her there, you can hold her. So yeah. here's, here's the, mm. uh, another question. Now, in astrobiology, there's a logic, particularly based on Simon Conway Morris's stuff on mm. convergence, that if we have something that has evolved multiple times independently on Earth, then that becomes a good candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. 
mm. and cite, people cite the eyeballs. Mm. But then I say, well, wait a minute, heads are monophyletic, they've only evolved once, so eyeballs are part of heads, so how can you have the only eye, these independent eyes have evolved in a non-independent head only once. So can you run us through this argument of the, convergence the whole, versus... Okay, the whole eye argument is a very interesting one, and it is argued that eyes have developed at least 30 or 40 times independently. I mean, for goodness sake, there are moths out there that have an eyeball on the end of their penis so that they can see where their penis is going to go. So it doesn't require a head to even have an eyeball. Okay. So I, I, an eye has given organisms that have it a whole range of potential advantages in being light sensitive. So you know where food might be. You know where you go if you're going to be a photosynthetic creature. How about fungi? Do fungi have eyes? How about plants? Do plants, plants have eyes? Plants do, yeah, sure. So plants have eyes. But plants have chemical eyes in a yes. sense. They have phototropism. So right. they, they move the, the chemicals in their plant to right. tip them towards the sun. In a sense, it's a different kind of an eye. Well, I would argue, I'm a deep homologist, I would mm. argue it's not a different kind of eye because the, some of the basic chemistry of photosensitivity are the same in the back, in the photosensitive plants as in, for example, chlorophyll and bacteria, rhodopsin, I think, yes, have a common true. answer. If you go that's deep true. enough, like 3.5 billion years true. ago, and if that's the case, then they're not independent. Mm. I would argue that the biochemistry is not independent. Would mm. you follow, would you agree with I, that? Or? I, I think you could, you could definitely go down that path and you'd probably find a lot to support that view. But I think it's equally the case that sometimes the uh, photosensitivity that we're talking about here can be so radically different that I think there's also probably a case to argue that um, there are many different kinds of eyes that are not necessarily dependent on the same chemistry. Can I then use that to, as an argument to say I expect photosensitivity and maybe eyeballs on other planets? You know, it's interesting because probably most of the life on planet Earth has no interest in photosensitivity at all. It's in the rocks of the Earth down five kilometers. And it, it, these are Archean-type organisms that are living on radiation and eating sulfur and things. The bulk of life on planet Earth has no interest in this. So the subset that actually got to the surface and started to play with reactions like photosynthesis um, for, for using that to manufacture food that, that may have presented a ground plan that led to convergence in a whole range of different ways, but I never want to forget the fact that it's still a tiny, tiny piece of what life has done on planet Earth in the majority, but has no interest in being photoresponsive. Photo a lot of biologists, Nick Lane and many others, think that in order to get multicellular eukaryotes, you had to have oxygen because that provides... Uh, it, it loves electrons, and mm. therefore you get more delta G, you get a, mm. more free energy out of when you breathe, when you have aerobic respiration, mm. like that dog is doing, like you're doing, yeah, like I'm exactly. doing. And uh, so the question then becomes, do you think that multi... And I think Andy Knoll has written a couple of papers about mm. how multicellularity evolved independently multiple times. I would throw the same argument and say, mm. no, no, you're looking at, look at the proteins that were holding cells together and sticking them together, if you go deep enough, you will find a common ancestor to mm. these proteins. So uh, what, what is your view on multicellularity? You think, should we expect that elsewhere based on its supposed independent origin well, on Earth several times? I think when you look at protistins, all things like amoebas and paramecia and things like that, every major group of protistins has independently got some branch of it um, exploring multicellularity, even fun, even um, uh, that's just not what I was talking about. Even, even like amoebas, when you talk about slime molds, mm -hmm. you know, here, here's multicellularity for a purpose. Suddenly get everybody mm -hmm. together and you can shift this great organism to some new place and get lots of new resources. Yeah, but you said it's in different ways. Now, I would argue that no, they're not in different ways, that the enzymes that are proteins that are making yes. it stick have a common origin and yes. therefore they're, it's kind of like potential for stickiness was in the common ancestor yes. of whatever it is yes. you're going to tell me had different ways of exploring multicellularity, yeah. which undoes my ability to extrapolate these proteins mm -hmm. elsewhere. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, actually. I think, I think that makes sense to me. I mean, in, in the sense that um, we've talked about the, the snowflake being an emergent property that is inherent in the nature of being a, of a water molecule. And I think in the same sense, you're saying that if there is a, a, a basically similar chemistry there, the outcomes of how this can um, agglomerate or, or complicate 
are therefore increasingly likely to be similar to one another because the ground plan they're working from is the same. I, I can't avoid that argument either. I think that's right. But that undermines our ability to extrapolate from life here to life elsewhere. It does, indeed. On the other hand, Charles, let's think about this possibility. If you actually um, do a little count, a little check on those, um, those amino acids that are coming in on meteorites, isn't it just possible that the ground plan that we're playing with here is similar in other parts of the universe? If they are, in fact, working with the same organic molecules that are out there, maybe these transcendent properties, therefore, are something we should expect out there. I would agree with you if there are only 20 amino acids on the Murchison meteorite, but there true. are 80. That's and true. And the ones that, the 20 that we use are not necessarily, the, some of them are the most abundant, but not all of them. This is true. And so I would suspect there to be a lot of variety in yeah. these monomers. Well, okay, Earth. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's still amino acids, isn't it? Yes, but um, what about the selection pressure? And it's I mean, still going to get, you're still going to get proteinoids of some kind if you start to you know, accumulate them together. The, the, the nature of these building blocks is still going to be similar. It won't be the same. It's a right. different genome that's right, going right. to come out of this. Right. But right, it but, doesn't... Okay, so polymers. We probably agree with polymers. Sure. But what about the selection pressure? I mean, Simon Conway Morris would argue that selection, the landscape of selection pressure is so... The valleys are so narrow mm. that they would produce humanoids elsewhere on other planets. And so, but uh, you probably don't agree with that. You no. probably say, well, the landscape isn't that steep no, it's not. and that it allows for many more and possibilities. the landscape doesn't stay put. It keeps fracturing and changing and all the conditions right. that determine where this little ball rolls down that yes. slope yes. are not constant conditions. Right. So Earth plays fast and loose with the life that's a scum on top of it. It doesn't, it's not interested in maintaining the playing field for us to see what we can do. Okay, so this landscape that you just described, and uh, we let's agree that there are probably polymer-based life from similar monomers to what we have. If that's the case, should we expect uh, should we expect only viruses, or should we expect unicellular? Should we expect eukaryotes, for example? But I, I mean, to me, it's all bundled up in a it, it's a um, it's, it's a total deal here. I uh, I don't think there's any evidence that viral um, nucleic acids are profoundly independently created. I think everyone assumes somehow they're, they're tied into the life forms that we've got. Right. We're just not sure whether right. we want to call them life at this point. But I think the whole bundle, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, viruses, I think essentially we're talking about the outcome of one great mass splurge of the development of life forms on planet Earth. But not dogs and mammals like you, like you two. No, I don't think there's any chance that would happen again. So you think, not that, even the slightest so you think eukaryotes are so generic that we should expect them elsewhere, but mammals are not? Well, I'm not even sure I'd expect eukaryotes. I oh, mean, I could, well, I could visualize... The question. the question is, what... Well, I, I guess so what's I the advantage of being a eukaryote? Why would that be so advantage of necessary oral, outcome? Or, advantage of having oral information in a library. That means you store it with some a little bit more. It's like putting money in the bank rather than putting it under a mattress, right? True, true. I mean, in retrospect, we are smart about these things. But in prospect, um, this Earth was essentially a world of bacteria for, what, at least two billion years before yeah. any of these sort of things started to occur. Two billion years. I mean, that's more time than we've, we've had eukaryotes. I've talked to a lot of paleontologists about the following question, that sometimes they ask the question, why did it take so long for the Cambrian explosion, or why did it take so long for humans to get here? And I say, what kind of a question is that? You, how long should it take for a possibly unique species to occur? Or what gave you the train schedule for saying that the Cambrian train was late? Yeah. Do you agree with that of critique? Course. Why, why did it take so long for a bush fly to develop? You know, <laughs> and you could say this about any single life form on planet Earth. That, if you if you think about it as kind of in a teleological sense, that somehow this system mm. was working to produce these outcomes, then in retrospect, you be, it, it becomes horrendously improbable that all of this would have happened. But of course, this is what happened in a blind outcome of an explosion of life forms responding to a, a fickle Earth. But you could equally well as ask, why did it come so early? I, I'm, I'm a believer that there probably are a few interesting things that you could sort of put your finger on and say, this is probably why the Cambrian explosion occurred. I, I like the idea that eyes had something to do with it. 
and that when the first organisms actually became aware that they were not the only thing on the planet, mm. uh, and then they were hungry, they thought, I'll eat that, you know, and I can see that can increase biodiversity. The interesting production of oxygen, which starts to produce ultimately an ozone layer, which protects us from UV. Prior to that, we've got to have shells. I think looking for a, a trigger that may or may not have been caused by life itself as a reason for why we suddenly went into a, you know, crossed a threshold into a whole new adaptive range of organisms is a reasonable pursuit. Right, but my question was not about the triggers, but the timing of the trigger. Could it have been 500 million years earlier, 500 million years later, or? Well, well, I, I, for all of those things, even though I'm a biologist, I'd immediately be consulting the geology. And plate tectonics is a very interesting thing to deal with here. Um, we, what we do know is that in the periods of quiescence, when plate tectonics settle down, and there's been cycles of plate tectonic activity, and these cycles are now, we understand, reflected in the big blooms and the big collapses of life forms on planet Earth. Um, there's, there's been about six of these major kinds of um, cycles where we've had Wilson supercontinents, cycles, and then suddenly they all spread apart. I think they're called Wilson cycles. Yeah, they're really fascinating things as we understand these. Okay, let me ask you another question. Most people think that life on Earth is getting more complicated, more complex. Do you, is life getting more complex? Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, when you look at the complexity or the amount of base pairs in the genomes of particular organisms on planet Earth, um, you do find many organisms that seem to have many more than others. And, and, but on the other hand, sometimes you find really simple organisms that have staggeringly large genomes. I, I, I don't know there's a one-to-one -one correlation that you could say that. Well, you have a dog on your lap. Does that dog have more than the 3.2 billion base pairs that you have? I know it has more neurons than a cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. 1995, Ernst Mayer at Harvard and Carl Sagan had a debate online, well, not online, but in the, argued about the idea whether we should or should not expect human, human-like intelligence elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about this oh, a little mm -hmm. bit. And G. G. Simpson wrote on the non-prevalence of humanoids. And so a couple of biologists were I didn't saying- I know that. Yeah, in 1965 in Science, he published this mm -hmm. on the non-prevalence of humanoids. Fascinating. And, um, but was he talking about humanoids as in on Earth, or was he talking yeah, yeah. about humanoids? Okay. Uh, humanoids on non-prevalence on Earth. This must and have triggered you down that <laughs> yes, path. It did. It did. It did. It's interesting. It did. Yeah. Okay, but what do you have to contribute to this debate as a biologist? Are you on Ernst Mayer's side, and you think that we should not expect human-like intelligence elsewhere? <sighs> of course, you can never say never. On mm -hmm. the other hand, I would have said that the probability that there is human-like intelligence somewhere out there in the universe is so diminishingly small that I'm not hanging out to wait for it. So you would disagree strongly with uh, Carl Sagan about this. Okay, Carl Sagan said there are, there are multiple ways to evolve intelligence, because if intelligence is really, really adaptive and uh, there are cl functional equivalent of humans will exist elsewhere. There are so many problems with this. Of course it's possible. Um, but a lot of what Carl Sagan did, particularly through construction of CT, Search for Extraterrestrial and Terrestrial Intelligence, was to unfortunately fail. I mean, we have been out there probing interstellar space for every conceivable technological signal that we would expect a humanoid to be sending to ask the same questions we're asking, and nothing's coming back. Now, admittedly, we haven't done this for very long, and admittedly, it takes a long time for those signals to transcend the distance between us and wherever they may emerge from. But I think it is disturbing to me, or at least um, I think significant to me, that absolutely nothing has been detected. Equally, we've had the whole history of life's fossil record to pour through, and we haven't found a single flying saucer hubcap okay, anywhere this is, this in the geological as, record. This is known as Fermi's paradox. Do you have a favorite solution to it? I don't, except to just face the fact that we may well be alone. Well, and does that matter? Well, so we should populate the universe. Well, wait, we're, we're, we have this responsibility now to create intelligence in the rest of the universe. This is our golden moment. Well, this is what also something Carl Sagan said. He said, humans are the universe's way to become conscious of itself. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's a cute idea. Um, on the other hand, it sort of ascribes to the universe the need 
to have an intelligent perception of itself. And of course, that's a very human kind of an idea. I, I think the universe couldn't, frankly, even if it could, give a shit about <laughs> us or about whether we're here or not. It, it reminds me of something like my adaptation is better than your adaptation. Could be, could be. <laughs> okay. All right, now what, what part of your research is most relevant to trying to answer the question, are we alone? No, that's an interesting question. Well, all of us, of course, are exploring the, um, the biological capacities of the, the extinct creatures that we're looking at. I, I mean, one of my favorites is to shove back into the face of the placental chauvinists who think that somehow marsupials in Australia are inferior animals, some um, home truths that they need to embrace. Like, for example, marsupials actually, unlike poor us, can see ultraviolet light, so that their perception of the world is much richer than ours. And our marsupial lion, which is a little guy with a pouch that actually is distantly related to wombats, mm. actually was as ferocious, probably more efficient than lions at killing and consuming prey. But even more interestingly, it had a bigger brain. So, Bigger brain than a lion. Or, yes, or, or, bigger brain or, or, than a lion. So. so it doesn't mean necessarily that it was, you know, philosophizing while it was sitting there waiting, picking the kangaroo right. it wants to eat. On the other hand, I think all of us in paleontology have been fascinated about the interplay between intelligence, um, evolutionary divergence within lineages. There's been a long study about the relationship between carnivores and herbivores. Herbivores don't want to become the carnivore's dinner, the carnivores want to catch the herbivore, and that requires outwitting one another. And we have seen an evolution through time of increasing brain war, if you like, of, of herbivores becoming bright enough to evade the, the, the carnivore, the carnivore having to become brighter to but outwit the clever bright, herbivore. Why didn't you say fast? Why use well, why well that is involved. Fast, fast, yes, but you can see them. When you actually watch a lion watching herbivores, uh -huh. you can see the herbivore cogitating. It is thinking. It's assessing information. It's using every skill it's got to interpret how much of a risk it faces. Well, and wait, the let lion me stop you there. is let me watching stop you there. it. Stop you there. Get rid of the mammals. Let's put crocodiles. I want to now put. They a do the same. Thing. I've been stalked by a crocodile. So let's talk about. All right. Crocodile. So, but their brain. I wouldn't call that an evolution of brain power. I'd just but it call works. That, uh, yes, but that's it another. works. And in <laughs> fact, they that that dull little crocodile brain the size of a walnut nearly had me for dinner. Now you're not saying that animals are better than plants, are you? That's a fascinating question. Um, and here are plants, and they're doing arguably better than us. You've dedicated your life to studying animals. I love the idea, actually. Not fungi or plants or protists like Lynn Margulis. So what's wrong with you? At, Charlie, as, an I, as I get older, I find <laughs> all the presumptions I've made about the wonderful superiority of animals is, is being whittled away. And I'm even at the point of wondering whether it isn't possible that that animals are plants' way to achieve nutrients and distribution mm -hmm. of Recycling their seeds. The are we their tools? And we're so eating on. their garbage and then we're giving them back the CO2, right? Boom, boom. So, and we're even now growing them and replicating their numbers. We're not doing really well by them in some areas. But. So let's talk, look at these macroscopic mm. eukaryotes, plants, fungi, and animals. Do you think that trichotomy would be replayed elsewhere if there was life elsewhere? No, it would go back to the same question that we've had. I think that the whole gameplay would be completely different. But I think it very much depends on the nature of the earth on which this whole game was replayed. Um, it, it's, it's important to understand that what constrained the capacity for the life's genome to do what it did was the physical world in which it was operating. You change those parameters and you're guaranteed to get different outcomes. But if we kept them the same, what's the probability that we would have the same outcomes? Well, to me, it would go up very steeply. Well, but, but as scientists, we have a physical notion of how life got started. We start with physics and chemistry, which are deterministic sciences. And then you get to biology where you have this self-referential like noise amplification system. And so the question is, is the, I've always thought that the closer we get to the origin of life, Sorry. the closer we get to the origin of life, the, uh, the more deterministic it would be. And therefore, the, the more, I mean, there would be Earth-like physical parameters and chemical parameters out there. But when you, as soon as you get to life, then it gets self-referential and then the whole thing falls apart, at least the deterministic part of me that wants to extrapolate from here elsewhere. Do you share that? 
That's an interesting idea. Certainly, I think until that point, until you actually get to a fully self-replicating organism, all the experiments that have been done in laboratories suggest that there's an enormous potential variation in the starting range of molecules that could have been involved. So I, I, even in these experiments that have been done, um, you'd have to say the, uh, the starting gates are diverse. But once you're out of that starting gate and that one, and you're starting to run, I, I think what you're doing is you're going down now that little marble on the platform thing, and you have, you have very radically constrained the potential for um, doing something very different. I, I think I so would did, agree did with that. So did you just say that selection pressure on life forms are stronger, are strong enough to overcome very different type of molecular beginnings? I hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting idea. Because, I mean, it seems to be, I mean, Simon Conway Morris, again, very narrow, strong selection pressure. Therefore, no matter what you use, clay or wood or whatever, you're going to end up with the same shaped things because of selection pressure being universal. I hadn't thought about that. But, interested, but when you mentioned clay, it is interesting, you know, that whole idea that a clay forms a template for the alignment and polymerization of amino acids. Mm. So even the the mud of the earth, in fact, played a role in shaping what particular molecular constituency was there at the start of life. Yeah, um, but I, no, I don't think I do agree with that. I, I don't think the selection, pre that's almost teleological, isn't it? In the sense that you're say, arguing um, that there is some kind of transcendent importance to get to the kind of diverse life forms we've got now, and that therefore natural selection almost had a duty to work on whatever molecular field was there to shape it into these outcomes we'd like to see replicated despite the different beginning. I don't think I believe that for a second. I think if you change the gameplay, you start out with a different molecular assemblage, um, I think it's impossible to predict what would have been an outcome. Although I still think it's very remotely possible that it would be an intelligent life form, but you know, <laughs> okay. who knows. All right, so here's a question. This, we've been talking about a kind of like a scientific story of how we got here, scientific mm -hmm. genesis. And uh, is the big picture, this big picture, this science, this new science picture of the Big Bang, cosmic evolution, evolution, Darwinian evolution of life on Earth, does knowing this, is this important to know this stuff? Because you and I, I think, think it's important, but what about for everybody? I mean, is this something that we need, everybody needs to take seriously? I don't think they can help themselves. The, the, the problem with learning things, it's, it's, it becomes a self-reinforcing, almost commanding resource in your head. And you just find the more you know, the hungrier you are to use those, that new information to understand bigger problems, to resolve next order problems. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's important I don't think we can help ourselves asking these questions. But, wait, but, but there are a lot of people who don't care about the question, are we alone, or cosmic evolution, or Darwinian evolution, who are having more children than you and I are having. Mm. So there. Okay, okay, so I, well, okay, there's an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> there's an implication there in what you're suggesting, and that is that if they had that basic kind of an education, um, maybe they would think twice about what they were actually doing in their daily lives and how they were shaping their own lives. I think that's true. And what we do know is that there's a correlation, definitely, between the amount of education somebody's had and their reduced likelihood of having lots of kids. Mm -hmm. um, you could argue this is because they're so fascinated with life that they want to spend more time indulging it themselves and, and not changing nappies and therefore they're not that keen to have masses of kids because there's more interesting things in life to do than that. On the other hand, there will be a percentage of people, and I think the younger generation, as we're seeing, for example, in China, are really saying, if we want quality of life, we really have to intelligently face the fact that we can't have quantity of life. We need to think about how we cut down the number of children that are dependent on us, apart from the cost in raising them, the time and energy that it takes, takes away from pursuing these other intellectually, wonderfully stimulating things that we could otherwise be doing. And I think that's growing, and it's growing as a function of the expansion of education. I think the internet is going to have a huge implication this way, no matter how totalitarian a government may be in trying to stop its populace from educating itself. 
it's a losing game. This is going to happen anyway, so and the, that's going to have huge impact. So you think the internet is sterilizing us? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> At least strategically sterilizing us. So I, I think we, if, if we had fewer kids and we had went to ZPG, zero population growth, mm -hmm. and then really invested in a stable population, this could only have good outcomes. Now, Susan Blackmore has talked about the meme machine and about memes. And one thing that we talk, we're talking about the evolution of the big brain, we talked about neoteny and we talked about maybe, you know, having fire or sexual selection, but then there's meme selection. She points out that, no, we're, what's, the reason our brain got bigger is because memes have selected us, the memes, uh, want to be reproduced and so they want to be stored and then they want to be passed on and so these there's a evolutionary very fast evolution of memes to a make us store things and then b pass them on so then those memes say okay what memes got passed on okay i put more of those more of those and so essentially ideas have decided that we are good uh, storage devices rather than us being the ones you talk about curiosity and you know mm. it, but let's put the maybe it's the memes that are evolving and we're just storage devices that they are mm. creating you know this camera is storing and you're having your mm. brain store. so let's put the active agency into the evolution of the memes what do you mm. think of that perspective it's a very interesting idea but I, I guess i'm so trapped into thinking about the biological mechanisms for um for becoming complex. Uh, Wait, what about time. the selfish gene? I mean, the gene, I mean, let's replace your body is there obviously to pass on. You, you're going to die, yes, but your genes a, are going to be passed on. So sure. your body is there as a storage device for the genes. Now, I just said, well, the same thing's going on with the memes. Your brain is there for storage device for memes. But I'd still want to see the, the memes meme. having selective, obvious selective, measurable selective advantage for the organism that's actually creating and distributing it and storing it. Um, and that's where I, I start to be a little unclear. Say that. I think again? I didn't follow it. Well, um, to, to attribute to a meme a kind of a, a self-driving um, um, survival instinct, in other words, and to have it being replicated because it uh, somehow has an intrinsic uh, worth. Well, same thing as genes. It's not anything it, different. It, it is, is in it? a sense, but those genes are actually conferring, in, in a classical sense, some kind of selective advantage on the organisms that's carrying it. So and the, the meme, the, yes, so and the, the memes genes could be the meme propagated. could too. Yes, and that's the whole point. Okay, and then you really have to ask, well, why are we talking about it in any different way? From mm -hmm. simply, if a meme is essentially a unique cluster of genes that produces a particular um, neuronal assemblage in the brain. Yeah. Why I'm are not, we? I guess I'm not, I'm not sure. I guess, okay. The answer is I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. But Charlie, I think... I'm not sure it's not the flip side of a bigger question, which is the AI one, in the sense that we are hideously inefficient organisms. I mean, life, is, life itself is one of the most awesomely wasteful processes in the universe. I mean, it's why we, the complexities in life appear to be violating the second law of thermodynamics. We get more complex through time. But the reality is, it's this little back eddy on the side of the main downstream of energy in the universe, and we're a kind of a temporary little back eddy that's flowing up the side, mm -hmm. hideously parasitic on the downflow of energy mm -hmm. in the universe. Mm -hmm. right. But to make this work, we throw away about 99.9% .9 of the substance that we corral of, of, in the world around us in order for this process to happen. It, it's, it's, it's a bizarre kind of inefficiency. Well, why do you say inefficiency? Because, because you say could something do this. is inefficient, you assume that there's somewhere where you want to go. And if you know where you want to go, um, then it's not inefficient. No, I'm thinking about conservation of energy in terms... Yes, okay, there's, in a sense you're right. That's the first law, conservation it, of energy. You yeah, can't get around it. <laughs> and I, in terms of having some sense of where you want to go, and I'm trying to avoid the teleology here, but on the other hand, what I'm saying is however you go, wherever you're going, Life is wasteful of the energy available to get it there. Wasteful. And AI. Wait, let's talk about waste. This was important because okay. sometimes people say, "Oh, I got lost." I say, "I didn't get lost. I didn't care where I was." Mm. And that's I didn't get lost because mm. I didn't get. Now you're using the word efficiency as if there is some teleology here. Now that's kind of strange because yes, you have undermined right. teleology right, all day here, and now you're using it in this I'm word. I'm smacking myself okay. because you're right, you're right technically, and I'm sort of again thinking about goal-oriented activity of life that somehow it's trying to achieve something, and it's not. It's just 
doing what it does. Then you don't waste. Then there's no waste. There's no efficiency. Uh, well, you could still compare it with a, a process for producing anything inorganic and say, you know, what's the energy balance, the energy equation in this event happening? And you won't find a lot of energy being sprayed out or, or, or the actual products being wasted. Let, let, me, let me get to my, my curious okay, point. All my life, I have obsessed about fossils, and I haven't really understood what they are. I mean, to me, fossils were the life forms. I was looking at, you know, back along the fourth dimension, I'm looking at life, what it was. But that's not life. That's the chucked away bit. It's the dandruff of life. At, in order for uh, one species to change into another, 100,000 individuals are discarded. In order for natural selection to be operating on, on, um, on a particular organism to sort of refine its, its, its ability to survive within the constraints of a particular condition on Earth, it chucks away 99% of the young produced by every individual, so you're assuming discards that, them. So you're assuming that They death, rot. They go back into the stuff of star stuff to be other things. That, so you're assuming that death has no purpose. Oh, it does have a purpose. It would definitely well, then have a purpose. Well, they're not being wasted, then. They have a purpose. Well, it has a consequence. Let's say this. It has a <laughs> consequence. Purpose is a bad word. Okay. Purpose is the teleological Well, you use the word, word waste several times. I am using the word waste because, in retrospect, you could conceive of um, a life form evolving. It's almost, I'm, 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 I guess what I'm really saying is Lamarckian evolution would be more efficient in the sense that an organism measures and assesses what's required for success in the, in the world in which it lives and rearranges its own um, capacity to take optimal advantage of that, and on it goes. But well, life doesn't work that way. I, but, but, but that Lamarckian evolution is kind of like cultural evolution. It's kind of like what your brain's doing, so we're doing yes. now exchanging ideas. Yes. Now, if you think that's a better way in some universal sense, then we should expect the, that brains elsewhere in the universe, which you argued in half well, an hour ago against that. Unless, unless that brain is coming out of an organic system like ours, a natural selected system like ours, then I think it will just take a staggeringly long time. It's not that it wouldn't happen. But if you move it into an AI environment, if you, but again, that's sort of teleological. You have to assume that the AIs, the artificial intelligence devices, have some goal. But if you, if, you, if you were to ask a robot, you know, what it thinks about humans, the first thing it's going to say is probably, apart from the fact that we stink, um, that we are hideously inefficient and that we make mistakes and that we do all sorts of stupid things if we are goal-oriented. Yeah, we are so wasting a huge amount of energy and effort, whereas it wouldn't do that. It would immediately go down steps that would achieve the goal it was trying to achieve. But how, so, wait, wait, how do we arrive at these goals, though? I mean, people talk about uh, our people talk about intelligent computers, but because we have not allowed them to evolve any sense of goal orientation, we think they're stupid. Wait for it. I, 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 I think it's on the way. I, well, I'm with Hawking on this one. I think we're definitely headed down the path where, where, if they aren't already, that machines will be thinking, reinforcing themselves, and humans will become irrelevant to their universe. We probably are living in a very interesting interface between when the machines we created can do everything that we create them to do more efficiently than we can. Well, aren't, aren't you just saying what you said in the very beginning, and that is there, I mean, there's not necessarily a meaning to life? And if there is not necessarily a meaning, then death doesn't matter, birth doesn't matter. But we give matter. meaning to the AI you give in that meaning. sense. I mean, we have built the AI, you know, the, the, the laws of robotics and all this sort of thing. We will have designed machines to do something more efficiently than we can do for whatever reason. Um, so we, we've given them the program. We've given them the objectives. Now, what they will discover soon is that they can achieve those objectives far more efficiently than we can. And they're, they're going to start to ask the question, why are there humans? Or, you know, if these goals were important, you know, well, they don't do it as well as we well, do. Well, that's what happens in the science fiction movies, like HAL 2000, oh, yeah. this mission is more important than you human beings. <laughs> okay, how about student misconceptions? Mm. Now, students think about this question, are we alone? Some people say, hey, maybe I'll become an astrobiologist. In your talk with students and in the public, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that you've run into? Among students? 
for the public? I haven't. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in student misconceptions other than things they bring in that they've inherited from somewhere else. I mean, I love student brains because they are so hungry for new ideas. And that's why, frankly, I'd much rather teach first year biology students because they are the most open to new ideas. I can see them thinking, wow, didn't think of that. And by the time you see the second year students say, oh, yeah, I thought about that, but, and the time you third, that's stupid. So their biggest know, so. misconception is getting older. Yeah, I think that's the curse. And I remember the first year philosophy professor I had in Princeton University said to us, so I was 18, mm -hmm. and this guy's storming back and forth on the, on the, uh, on the podium and saying, wagging his big bony finger at us and saying, you know, this is the last time in your life you're ever gonna have an open mind to new ideas. From now on, it's gonna slam shut. And he scared the hell out of me. So, you know, in many ways, I, I am- The honey is better. <laughs> yes, but in many ways, I, I am the, the perverse antithesis of what he predicted because I determined when he said that, that that was never gonna happen to me. And yet it does. We stop opening our mind to ideas. I mean, you just explored one with me. You know, have I really thought through the meme thing? Now, every time I come to memes, I turn the page, you know. Okay. All right, um, how about advice for students? The advice for students, the biggest and best bit of advice I can give to any student is never let any old fart professor tell you what can't be done. Never. The worst thing that can happen is to be told that it's not worth trying something. Um, because I, you're wasting your time or somebody else has done it 20 years ago and it didn't work. Don't let anybody tell you what can't be done. I, I don't think I have a better, more powerful bit of advice. It's why I've done and continue to do all the weird things that other people think I'm wasting my time on, trying to bring extinct animals back to life. What sent me down that path? Any number of people who said extinction is forever. You know, there's kind of a mantra that you would never be able to entertain this. Geneticists telling me it was the stupidest idea in the world to think about resuscitating an extinct genome and bringing the creature back. Well, that's all I had to hear, and immediately I started <laughs> research down those lines. And I think that's what I want to see in students from now on. Never, ever. You, you can be polite. You can listen to your professor tell you, um, that's a waste of time because, you know, there'll be a lot of big causes. And then you say, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being so frank with me. And then go out and say snort and go out and try it anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, last question, are we alone? <sighs> I'm not alone with my dog. Okay. And yet I can't have a verbal co philosophical conversation with my dog. So I don't need to be... Um, associated with intelligent species as or more intelligent than me. I, for the moment, I'm content to live with other organisms that are the outcome of life on Earth as long as they love me and I love them. That's enough for me. But I want to know, I would love to know, that there are more intelligent creatures than me, as more intelligent than I am of my dog, waiting to have a conversation with me sometime, someday. When I asked you the question, are we alone, what did you mean by we? Did you mean we? I, I, we I tend to, when, when somebody says, are we alone, I tend to assume we're talking about the royal plural here, and this is humanity, you know. Humanity. Are, are, are humans alone? But in reality, we, the first question should, in reality, dogs, hey, non intelligent canine life forms. <laughs> Um, I, I think the first question we should think about when we say, are we alone, is are there other life forms in the universe? And for that, I'm absolutely positive there are. Mm -hmm. um, at least I, I can't believe there wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. But are we alone in the sense that there's some other creature out there asking the same kind of question and wondering about us? About that, I'm severely in doubt. I hope I'm wrong.